has been up to you to take score of water on that for as precaution. Imagine trying to move by vomiting out of a giant straw and flapping your scurvy out very, very fast. That is how a cuttlefish feels. The cuttlefish brain is larger than its entire body, including its brain, which may not make sense, but it does about the cuttlefish. The cuttlefish is not a fish. It is a mollusk of the class Cephalopoda. The cuttlefish is a bit like a clam that millions of years ago came out of its shell and never went back. In fact, it still has a specialized shell, but on its inside, which is used for buoyancy, and is called the cuddle ball. People for a long time have used this shell to carve casts for metal jewelry. These people are called cuddle ballers. By me, and now by you. To move through the ocean, the cuttlefish has a wavy, wavy fin that surrounds its mantle. It also has a siphon, a muscular tube it can squirt water out of for fast propulsion. Imagine trying to move by vomiting out of a giant straw and flapping your skirt around very, very fast. True fact. Here are true facts about the cuttlefish. The cuttlefish is not a fish. It is a mollusk of the class Cephalopoda. The cuttlefish is a bit like a clam that millions of years ago came out of its shell and never went back. In fact, it still has a specialized shell, but on its inside, which is used for buoyancy and is called the cuddle ball. People for a long time have used this shell to carve casts for metal jewelry. These people are called cuddle ballers. By me, and now by you. To move through the ocean, the cuttlefish has a wavy, wavy fin that surrounds its mantle. It also has a siphon, a muscular tube it can squirt water out of for fast propulsion. Imagine trying to move by vomiting out of a giant straw and flapping your skirt around very, very fast. That is how a cuttlefish feels. The cuttlefish brain is larger than its entire body, including its brain, which may not make sense, but it does to the cuttlefish because it has a very large brain. The cuttlefish has a very advanced eye, roughly in the shape of Charlie Brown's mouth when he misses a football, or perhaps a W. But someone wrote the letter drunk, or the letter Q, but someone wrote the letter really drunk. Despite its big brain and weird eyes, the cuttlefish is colorblind, which is curious because it is a color magician of the deep. Like a lactose intolerant cheesemaker, the cuttlefish is unaware of its own gifts. With the help of millions of color changing things in its skin, it can change color and texture almost instantaneously. Playing hide and seek with a cuttlefish sucks. They don't move, they just change color. They can live and breathe on the top. How the cuttlefish determines the backgrounds it blends into is largely a mystery, because it can do it in complete darkness, which is kind of a task if you ask me, but still amazing. Cuttlefish! <laughs> then there's the flamboyant cuttlefish, which doesn't try to blend in with, it just says, why doesn't the world try to blend in with me? You go, little man. Don't go changing from nobody. When it is threatening, the cuttlefish will often release ink from its ink sack. The cuttlefish releases that ink in one of two ways. One is a little, a little sort of squirt. Something you might say, excuse me, after. The second is a release of both ink and mucus. More of a throw your underwear out and go home early sort of inking. These are called pseudomorphs, and are designed to be decoys for the cuttlefish as it escapes. The cuttlefish feeds by expending two hidden feeding chemicals, which it uses to snag prey and pull it back towards its poison beak. What? Well, apparently it has a beak. Very slowly it extends. <laughs> Other fish just have to move like two inches. Cuttlefish mating begins when the male delicately grabs the female by the face and inserts another specialized tentacle into an opening near her mouth, which I hope is not her nose, and inserts sperm sacs. Males have four pairs of arms and females have three. Weaker males often disguise themselves as females by hiding through their arms. 
This reminds me of what I may or may not have done in the year as a young boy. These cleverly disguised males swim right past the competition and do the face sex thing. After the female eggs are fertilized, she gingerly and lovingly puts her eggs in some random fruit hole on the bottom of the ocean. The eggs are called sea grapes by people who like wine, and they are guarded by the couple until they hatch into the cutest little freaks in the universe. These little babies are not so good at the camouflage but they do the best that they can. Cover yourself up, little man, and sleep tight. Remember, if you ever want to come out of your shell and let your freak flag fly, the cuttlefish has your back. On the front. I, don't, I can't tell with them. It's on the back. The point is, don't let the tangible parts wrap around your head. Or if it happens, <laughs> I love that guy. I used to think it was Morgan Freeman talking. But uh, it's a guy named Z Frank. Oh, goodness. Let's see. What am I going to share with you first? So um, I've been thinking about... Um, Uh, what to talk about today, and I decided to talk about um, x-ray spectroscopy just as a sort of a fun, weird thing to talk about on, the, on our last day, right? And um, hey, how's it going? Good, good. Excellent. Have a good day. Have a Safe drive. No little case today with you. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. So um, the <clears throat> the nucleus, as you are aware, is the source of one of the lowest energy photons that we can uh, get our paws on as as human critters, right? I I don't know. I suppose you could. In theory, you could create lower energy photons with them, um, like an oscillator and an antenna. Um, I, I don't really know, like, like the sort of the physical phenomena that, that underpin that, you know, it's just like the bulk conduction of electrons and put them through U-turns and make them, you know, give them a gap, and whatever, and you can convert them into photons like an antenna does, right? But the nucleus um, in, in, um, in a magnetic field can create beautiful 60 megahertz photons, you know. And um, it's just by, you know, that, that's a hydrogen nucleus has a certain uh, property. It's called the gyromagnetic ratio, which sets the relationship between the frequency of the photon and the strength of the magnetic field, or the frequency of precession of the spin axis around a, a, a magnetic field, right? <clears throat> so, um, So it's the tiniest part of a, you know, it's the tiniest part of normal matter. You know, it's not a subatomic particle, but it is It is a tiny part. They're about um, 10 to the minus 12 meters, I think, for a nucleus. And yet they can create some of the longest frequency uh, radio waves, right? Uh, next, you've got electrons, right? And the electrons are actually, they have no dimension. There's no size. There's just bigger than some ridiculously small size or, or smaller than some ridiculously small size, right? That's all that we know about them. You know, they're, they're smaller than, you know, 10 to the minus 15 meters or something, you know? And they, they also, they have a, 
they also have a spin magnetic moment and uh, and they and they create microwaves so in, in a similar strength magnetic field where the nucleus transacts in radio frequency the electron will transact in microwave frequencies right <clears throat> and then um, then you go up in scale from these um, a, atomic constituents to actual molecules. And when they rotate, they emit and absorb microwaves. And then there's an interesting uh, frequency range that never gets talked about in uh, chemical circles, but it's actually very important now. Oops. In, in a commercial sense, and that's uh, the far infrared. And there's a, there's a light source called the quantum cascade laser, which puts out these chirps of, of a frequency that, that um, I think they start on the high frequency end and then they, and they ring down into a lower frequency range. But you can chirp them for, and then Fourier transform the, um, the detection and you can get the uh, an, uh, optical spectrum from in the far infrared from uh, the quantum cascade laser. And when you interpose materials in there, you can get the far infrared absorption spectrum, which is full of interesting information, right? It's, it's a very penetrating radiation. It goes through tissue, it goes through pharmaceutical tablets that goes through plastic and water and all kinds of good stuff. The absorptions tend to be weak, but they, they and they are completely opaque in terms of what they mean. It's like, pff, who knows, right? But they're unique and they're big, great fingerprints, right? So if you can, if you, if you're in a quality control setting, you can just get says, okay, these tablets are good, right? If they change, we want to know. So you run the, the uh, far infrared spectrum of them and that gives you a lock on the quality, right? And when that changes, you do, do not know what happened, but you know something changed. And typically it's a polymorph or water or something solvent that it picked up. And they're described as being sensitive to the inter intermolecular vibrations, right? And uh, so who knows what they are, but, um, but uh, that's what happens. Then next comes the mid-infrared. And the mid-infrared uh, is full of strong absorptions, right? And um, so and these are uh, uh, in, intramolecular vibrational modes, right? And you know, like for example, the breathing mode of a of a benzene molecule, which is not infrared active, but it's Raman active, you know, and that, that will show up at a nice uh, you know, uh, sort of mid-infrared frequency range, right? And then there's a near infrared, which is populated with um, strong interactions in the form of plasmonic modes, and then weak. Uh, in interactions in the form of overtones for um, uh, uh, for the mid infrared modes. So, um, uh, as we mentioned earlier, plasmons are they have basically two uses for chemists nowadays, right? Uh, one is you can look at the uh, lambda for the plasmon, it's basic wavelength, right? There's a, a plasmon spectrum, will look like an absorption spectrum. And um, And 
and you may have one or two near infrared modes. And these modes will change in terms of their wavelength, depending on the refractive index near the surface, right? So they're refractive index sensors. Then the other thing that they do is that they uh, promote a uh, surface enhanced raw mode. So they are refractive index sensors and SIRS uh, column substrates. And SIRS, you'll probably remember, is stands for Surface Enhanced Raman Spectroscopy. And it's a way that you can uh, supercharge a Raman spectrum by a factor of 10 to the ninth. You know, you can, you can enhance the um, uh, Raman intensity by ridiculous factors. And um, in, in the extreme, you can take all of the energy that normally goes through a molecule as fluorescence and cycle it through Raman modes. So you can get a, a brightness on a Raman mode that's equal to the brightness of uh, the fluorescence in a rhodamine 6G molecule, for example. So that, that's an example of a 10 to the 12th order. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Are you writing something? Are you writing something? Because we don't see anything. Oh, uh, you guys. Oh, can you guys see the the? Um, oh shoot! Resume share. Your sharing is paused. Okay. How about okay. now? Yeah, I see you now. Oh shit. Pedagogical fail. God. Okay. Rewind. Replay the last 15 minutes. Ah. Okay. Anyway, we're just going through the spectrum, right? Then you get to the visible part of the spectrum, right? You can see this now, right? Just say yes. Dr. T, is there anything above the rotation one, the very top, or is that like the very beginning of it? Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's the first one. That's the first one. Okay, so I might publish this if I'm feeling frisky. But let's see here. So in the visible, right, that's the, that is the only part of the optical spectrum to which us humans are sensitive, right? We have, and our eyes are sensitive there, right? And that is almost entirely due to pi to pi star transitions, right? So every color that we see is due to, well, not every. There's a lot of weak colors that have that are DD transitions, but most colors we see are pi to pi star type transitions. <clears throat> and you know, pi orbitals they have a node along the intermolecular axis, right? You've got an atom here and here, You've got sort of a nodal plane there. And then you add a nodal plane there, and you get the pi star. <clears throat> And that's a that's a molecular property, right? Then you go to the ultraviolet, and you got sigma, sigma star, and a sigma star, stuff like that. You know, it's just like no nodes, one node, that type of thing, right? Now, um, the next regime 
that comes around is the um, is the X-ray regime, right? And whenever you take matter and smash it, smash it with an electron, you know, basically electrocute the, the Jesus out of something. It emits photons, right? It glows, and um, the frequency of light that is emitted when it glows is a function of the atomic number, right? So for example, hydrogen emits in the ultraviolet, helium is in the ultraviolet, lithium, beryllium, they're in the vacuum ultraviolet, and you can get all the way down to sodium, that's around one, one nanometer, potassium is 0.3 nanometers, chromium is 0.2, rubidium is 0 0.1, 0 0.04, 0 0.02, 0 0.01 for uranium, right? So uranium is the highest atomic number naturally occurring element, and it's X radiation starts around 0 0.01 nanometers, 0 0.1 angstroms. And um, this, um, uh, this type of uh, pattern is, um, you know, you can rationalize it based on the shell model of the atom, right? And the shell model is really nothing more than taking an atom and asking what the, the principal quantum numbers of each, uh, the principal quantum numbers of the electrons are, right? So um, there's the 1s electrons, principal, principal quantum, quantum number one, right? And there's 2s and 2p. There's 3s, 3p, and 3d, et cetera. And the, the energy of the electron is predominantly captured by that first quantum number, like the 1s, right? Then there's spin, which contributes a little bit, you know, depending on the present, presence of uh, electric magnetic fields, right? Then the p electrons, the s and the p's, they're almost all, energy levels are so are degenerate, right? They're the same. Um, so when you talk about um, the X-ray absorption and emission, if you make a vacancy in a 1S level, you get the K alpha lines, right? And let me just show you a picture of the K alpha lines. Well, actually, before I do that, let's talk about Henry Mosley. Okay. Henry Mosley, um, he was um, he was a racist Englishman. Yes. And he he lived around um, uh, 1905. He was he was in Rutherford's laboratory around 1905. And um, uh, yes, you need him back. You guys screwed it up, didn't you? You ran out of standard. Ah, what did you? You got to tell me what you messed up. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. So your sample was lower than your standards. Yeah. Okay, whatever. Have fun, have fun. I can't get these guys to give me a straight answer. But um, so Mosley, he was in Rutherford's laboratory, you know, in Rutherford, supposedly discovered the, well, he really did discover the atomic nucleus, right? Because be, they knew at Rutherford's time, this is like turn of the century, right? Ernest Rutherford, he was a Kiwi, 
which means he was from what country, Aditya? Is it England? Kiwis are from? Oh, sorry, Australia. What? New Zealand? Something. New Zealand, right. I can't hear anything. So he's from New Zealand, right? And he, he, he used to dig potatoes when he was a kid. And when he got a scholarship, he was so happy and he ran in screaming, that's the last potato I'm ever going to dig. And it was. And so he went to um, school and then he got to um, Cambridge or wherever he was. And um, he, he did really well, right? But the, the, there's a couple of things he's pretty well known for. One is the discovery of the identity of the alpha particle. Right. You could detect alpha radiation, but nobody knew what it was. And it turns out it's a helium nucleus that comes shooting out of the nucleus of, say, a radium or some radioactive nucleus, right? But, um, but you know how um, Rutherford figured it out? He was a smart cookie. And he was a good experimentalist, right? And he had, he had a glass blower make a, a little teardrop of, of glass and he filled that with rad, uh, radon. You know, radon gas, that's an alpha emitter. And then he put that teardrop into a bigger teardrop of glass, of thick glass, basically, right? And the thick glass, he, he evacuated it really well, right? So he has a radon-filled bulb in, a, in an evacuated bulb. And he just left it for a few weeks. And what he found was that the evacuated bulb filled up with helium. And he determined it was helium by ultraviolet absorption. Right? Very clever, very clever. And then he had... Uh, he had some of his guys looking at scattering from by a gold film, scattering of alpha particles, right? And they were doing angle dependent scattering and they had this uh, alpha source here, right? And they had a, a, a film plate on the back side. And they also had a control film plate on the front side, right? So they were coming in with this alpha beam here, right? And they're expecting all the alpha particles to scatter on the opposite side, right? And they did, 99% of them scattered on this back side. But a very small number of them were scattering. They were backscattering, hitting this gold film and backscattering. And it's like nobody, they just could not rationalize why, how could that be happening, right? But it turns out that the density of the nucleus is um, about 10 to the ninth times the density of normal matter, right? It's a thousand, it's all, all of the mass of, uh, of any given atom is in the nucleus, right? You know, there's one three thousand or so is the electrons, then the rest is nuclear matter, right? But the nucleus is extremely small. It's about a one one thousandth of the radius, right? So it's really, really dense. So it's mostly empty space and the alpha particles come through and they scatter off the fields, you know? There's positively charged nuclei and they scatter off the fields, but occasionally they come in and they hit it directly and they backscatter. And that small backscattered fraction allowed Rutherford to make the first estimates of the dimensions of the nucleus. And he was floored. Everybody, else, nobody believed him, right? But he had to work it out really carefully. And then he presented it to um, uh, the Royal Society uh, uh, in a meeting in which was attended by Lord Kelvin, right? And Kelvin was the, the most famous scientist on the planet at the time, right? But he was an old man, right? And Rutherford was scared crazy scared 
because he did not want to offend Lord Kelvin, um, uh, William Strutt or something like that. He didn't want to offend him because Kelvin was convinced that the nucleus was completely, A, completely immutable, unchangeable, and B, that the nucleus was, um, well, anyway, and, and he now he had something real controversial to say about the nucleus, right? And so he, um, so he tried to frame it in a way that that flattered uh, Kelvin, right? And Kelvin's hypothesis about the age of the Earth, I mean, he he had the age at like, you know, twenty thousand years maximum, you know, and he just based it on the cooling of this blob of magma, you know. And, I, and according to this, it had to be 20,000 or 25,000 years, you know, and he redid the calculation. They got 24 and 23.9 and 23.875, right? Just all these calculations, right? And he was sure that the earth was super young, you know, not, you know, not 4 billion. No, it was 20, you know, 25,000 years old, right? And, um, and so Rutherford was like, oh, this gives me a way to sort of get this in. And so he said, and it's radioactive decay in the earth emitting alpha particles and heating up, heating up the core. That is why the core of the earth is still hot, right? Because it's a big nuclear reactor. You know, there's just radioactive decay happening in there and there's no place for the heat to go. And so it stays hot, you know? But um, so Rutherford put it in this way and or, and and Kelvin didn't even notice. I don't think he he didn't even care at that point. But but um, Rutherford had a student named uh, Harry Mosley, right, around 1905, and Mosley was working on X-rays, and Mosley discovered that if you look at the lines and you divide them as by K and L, the uh, the um, these are the fluorescent X-ray lines, right? So you have to hit you have to hit a given nucleus with a high energy X-ray or an electron, and then it will emit certain X-ray wavelengths. And those X-ray wavelengths for each element form a series where if you plot the atomic or the frequency or the square root of the frequency versus the atomic number, you get a straight line, right? So um, what this basically means is that the energy is a function of Z squared. And what this is reflecting is the stabilization of the core electrons by the charge in the nucleus. So if you have a charge of two, it stabilizes four times more than a charge of one. And a charge of four sta stabilizes 16 times more than a charge of one. And so that's that way, if you plot the square root of the frequency, that scales with atomic number Z, right? So that was, a, that was an important revelation. And this is the basis of all um, X-ray fluorescence type spectroscopy. So um, nowadays you can take a, um, a spectrum, right? And you can uh, let's see here, and you can uh, um, you can analyze it basically in this way. That there is, um, uh, there's, there's N and there's L, and this is what we also call M sub L, right? And so you've got N, N starts at one, principal quantum number one, and that sets the energy of the core electrons, right? Then principal quantum number two, 
has S and P electrons, right? The P electrons have um, zero, uh, one, zero, and minus one. And the spin states are, uh, I don't know, one half, one half, and three halves. I'm not sure why the one halves are different levels there, but. Um, but um, these are the different energy levels available to principal, principal quantum number two. Then principal quantum number three, there's three S, three P and three D, right? And <clears throat> the, the K series are all filling these core vacancies, right? And there's K alpha, K beta and K gamma. Now K gamma will show up <clears throat> for um, nuclei that have principal quantum number four and above. So let's just see here. Um, got to get over to the periodic table here. Can do a new shit. And we can say, see here that um, uh, principal quantum number one, two, three, and four. So anything with D electrons has principal quantum number four. So these guys will have uh, SP and SPD. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Here's Mitra. My wife got a phone call. I don't know why I answered it. Uh, anyway, so um, uh, anyway, so this is this is how these the lines show up in the different. Um, in the different, uh, let's see here, in the different um, types of uh, spectra, right? So a given, um, and, and there's other sort of strange things about um, uh, the, uh, the absorption spectra, for example, of X-rays is uh, you can look at the, um, you can see these K and L lines, right? Um, for things like here's, this heavy line is for lead, right? And, um, and there's a K edge and then an L edge. There's one, two, three L edges, right? And the thing about the absorption is that for X-rays, the absorption increases gradually up to an edge, right? And so it's the maximum absorption that happens before the edge falls that determines the energy level. We're not used to that in chemistry, right? And this is this seems very strange from a quantum perspective, right? Because the 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 doctrine that we're given so up to this point is that photons do not interact with molecules until the photon energy equals the difference in two and between two energy levels in a molecule, right? That just does not happen for X-rays, right? X-rays behave like particles. X-rays and even more, uh, to an even greater extent, gamma rays behave like particles and they scatter off of X-rays, or as, I'm sorry, they scatter off of electrons. So the uh, X-ray will go in and it will, it will increasingly scatter up to the point where it can eject um, a K core electron and then the extinction coefficient falls. So there's this strange edge effect. And um, anyhow, uh, so you can see lead and then silver Silver is substantially lower atomic number than lead, right? So the K line is at a longer wavelength. 
math, right? So, any case, um, let's see. Then there's diffraction, which we're not going to talk about, and sources, etc. Let's see what else do I have to say about this subject, Dr. Terrell? Yeah. So for every element, there's a K and the L line. So the other multiple. Yeah, I believe so. Obviously not hydrogen. You know, hydrogen only has hydrogen doesn't even have a K line. <laughs> but <laughs> I think lithium has K, and then starting with sodium, now K and L. You know, I'm not absolutely sure, right? Because the, the, if you make a vacancy in the core level, the only one that can fill it is the, the only way to fill uh, 1S is from, from 2S or um, the whole first row. Um, the first row being um, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrate, and oxygen, fluorine. And, uh, and neon, right? So I think that the first row, or I'm sorry, the second row in the periodic table has only the K shell. I'm sorry, I'm not like an expert in this. I'm just sort of dabbling. I'm sharing. This is a share, right? So, um, but it's interesting, right? Because you can, you can now buy a, a handheld uh, x-ray source and it will irradiate, you can irradiate things and get the fluorescent x-rays back, right? The, um, you, when, you, when you irradiate with a high energy x-ray, you eject core electrons. When that core vacancy fills, then you'll get a fluorescent x-ray and that fluorescent X-ray will have a characteristic energy. And based on the spectrum of fluorescent energies that comes back, you can um, determine what elements make up a specimen. And that's um, X-ray fluorescence is an extremely convenient way to get an elemental analysis, right? It's the closest that will ever come to a tricorder. Well, until we actually get a tricorder, which is gonna, it's gotta happen eventually, right? A what? A tricorder? What's that? Somebody explained to Richard what a tricorder is. I can't believe you don't know what a tricorder is. There's actually two types of tricorders, right? There's the medical tricorder and your normal run of the mill Star Trek tart. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, right. And then there's the type that Spock carries, which well, is also the, the the Vidian tricorder, which allows you to take out people's intestines. Oh my god! Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's crazy. I did not know about that one. That is crazy talk. Oh my god. Oh my god. So let's see here. Um, uh, here is an X-ray fluorescence spectrum, for example, of uh, a banknote, right? And this has a wavelength dispersive spectrometer, right? So <clears throat> you can see titanium, barium, lead, chromium, iron, cobalt, zinc, tungsten, and lead. You can well, let it let comes up again, right? And a lot of these lines are chopped off, probably because they're they exceed the intensity um, threshold of the detector, right? But this is this is a this is an advanced. I I mean this is actually a spectrometer, right? Mm -hmm. And they they this is the two theta angle. And they, they direct the x-rays in through a crystal. And then they change the angle at which the crystal is oriented relative to the detector. 
and different theta two theta values will place different wavelengths in constructive interference. And so it acts like it, it's called a crystal monochromator. Right? <clears throat> crystal monochromators are great, but they're bulky, right? So what is often done is that you use a, um, um, they're called proportional counters. And in a proportional counter, when a single X-ray or gamma ray interacts with the proportional counter, it creates a whole cascade of carriers, right? And that cascade of carriers, you just integrate them, add up the charge from that blast of carriers, and that tells you the energy of that array, right? And so for proportional counters, they, they give relatively low, low resolution, right? But these are the handheld jobs, right? They can, you can have a handheld proportional counter here. You can see aluminum, potassium, sulfur, rhodium, titanium, iron, chromium, all, et cetera. So these are, these are definitely resolvable, you know, Oh, this is this rhodium is from the anode, right? So this is a uh, this is sort of a, like a resonance peak from the from the rhodium from the excitation, right? And then this is a diffraction peak, and then there's tin and phosphorus and silicon and aluminum, iron, vanadium, chromium. Etc. Right, and there's there are different designations. There's L, K, K alpha mainly, K beta, and then there's L, and these all depend on the um, origin of the electron that fills the core vacancy that you create with the. Um, uh, with the X-ray source, right? So anyhow, this is just how you can do this, and um, anyway, I think that's all I got today. Did you learn anything? Maybe about the cuttlefish. We learned something about the cuttlefish, right? Because it moves by blowing water out of a tube and waving its skirt. <laughs> and, uh, and that its brain is bigger than its body, which is okay if you're a cuttlefish because you have a big brain. Actually, they're cephalopods, right? Which means their brain is in their feet. Whatever that means, but their their little um, their little uh, nervous system is all through their body. What do you think, Aditya? So, if they lose a tentacle, do they lose a part of their brain? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. But they can grow it back. But it's like it's like having it's like having. It's like really being a slightly alien to yourself, right? Do you, have you ever heard the story of Phineas Gage? Phineas, yeah, Phineas Gage was a he was a uh, he was a foreman, and he was a very good worker, very good guy, and he was working in San Francisco, and um, uh, this um, it was a tamping rod. He was tamping down some explosives, and it the explosive charge ignited and it shot the rod through his chin and out his head. Are you guys picturing this? You can picture it through my head if you want. That might help. And, uh, and uh, it really wiped out half one complete hemisphere of his brain, right? But it turns out you do not need both of them. And Phineas, 
he went on, he lived for like 20 more years, but he was a rascal. And ever since that happened, he became a real rascal. He gambled all the time, you know, and he, 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 he used bad words and he gambled and he started out, he was a very straight laced guy, you know, and he couldn't be a foreman anymore because he, he lost his temper all the time. So, so in that Phineas Gage, he lost half his one brain and he was okay. <laughs> and the doctor's reports were just, just hideous. They're saying how, well, you know, the first doctor came and he just put a Band-Aid on it, you know? The second doctor came and he got in there with his finger and he was scooping out all this gray matter. <laughs> it's like, there's all this gooey stuff in there. Yeah, it's a brain. <laughs> You're scooping out his brain, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's gooey. <laughs> uh, anyway, <clears throat> so um, all of this is simply to say thank you guys for uh, a wonderful semester. Uh, thank you for putting up with me. Um, there's a periodic table. And um, I will. Um, there is a, there is a, an assignment due. It's the, it's the Grubley questions, which Calvin has done. And uh, thank you, Calvin, for making everyone do them. I'm just joking. It's okay, Kai. I would have made them do yet. I would have made you do them anyway. But um uh, they're due on the final, and then we are going to meet on the on the day of the final. And I will have one question for every single one of you, and that will be your final exam score. That's right. That's right. Your final exam will boil down to your answer to one unique question. Right. Is and it the same question for everyone or is it a different question? No, 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 it's a different question. I have to have I have to write down 13 questions, 13 chemistry questions, right? And your choice is you can answer it for an A. You can ask a colleague to answer it, and if they get it right, you get a B. And if they and if both of you get it wrong, you get a C. Not in the entire course. <laughs> How much is the question worth? A thousand points. <laughs> my wife is getting on my case right now because you know it's not going to be worth a thousand points. Uh, oh, this is like public interrogation style. Yeah. And I'm just trying to torture you. I just want to torture you. I, I'm not making a secret of it. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Oh, my wife is breaking my back here. No, but I'll ask you a question. Then we'll work it out. All right? My wife says you'll get an A. What do you think about that? Yes. The wife is always correct. Oh, yeah. That's right. Happy, <laughs> wife, happy wife, happy life. <laughs> exactly. Oh, geez. It's so true. Okay, guys. I'll see you all when I see you. Have a great time. Wait, Dr. T, what day is our final? <laughs> Oh, um, let me see. I will Next show Tuesday. you. Or sorry, the it Tuesday afterwards, the 15th. It's Tuesday the 15th at 5.15 p.m. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and um, and I'll send out a Zoom invite for it. And uh, and then we can get together. And uh, don't, don't worry about it too much. I, I promise not to ask hard questions. And if you can't answer the question, we have to work it out. 
as a group. Right? Yeah, is the uh, the Groobly paper questions due on the final day or is that due sooner? They're due on the 15th at midnight or the 14th at midnight, something like that. What did they do? Let's see here, hold on, assignments. Uh, oh, shoot. I didn't publish it, that's so weird. I go in and I do this and I, I make all the changes I'm like, oh, I'm done, you know? But then I forget to publish it. So they are due December 15th at midnight. <laughs> she knows me too well. Says I'm trying to torture you. And it's true. I just, I am basically the Prince of Darkness. Okay. I'll see y'all later. Bye, Dr. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Be good. Be good, everybody.